Well now we're into the season of bonfires and the hallowed eve of all saints so that means fun and chill on the outside and then afterwards some warm soups and hot suppers inside. Well one thing that uh, Halloween and bonfire night heralds is the arrival of this beautiful creature here, the pumpkin. Pumpkins will now be in season up until Thanksgiving Day and I want to show you a recipe for making pumpkin soup. Now pumpkin doesn't have a lot of flavour of its own but if it's made into a soup the texture is really velvety and lovely and it makes a wonderful soup. Now what you do with the pumpkin is you treat it exactly the same as a melon and you cut it up like a melon and then just like a melon you take the seeds out scrape them off into a bowl and then your pieces of pumpkin are all ready to go into the oven and be roasted now to roast them in the oven you need a blast of high temperature so you preheat the oven to its very highest setting now that means you've got to have this which is a really solid roasting tray because cheaper roasting trays just buckle in the high heat. So there we are, we're going to put the pumpkin onto the roasting tray in a little assembly line like that and then before it goes into the oven it just needs a little bit of seasoning of salt and pepper and then we're just going to brush it with the merest trace of oil and you need to have a flavourless oil for this so I'm using ground nut oil or that's sometimes called peanut oil which doesn't have any flavour but helps to give it that nice sort of charred crusty texture that we're looking for which does enhance the flavour of the pumpkin. Now that goes into your very high hot oven and you leave it there for about 25 minutes to roast until the pumpkin becomes tender. Right now while the pumpkin is roasting you start to make the soup in a large cooking pot like this Start off with a large onion, chopped, as you can see, fairly small, and brown it in one ounce of butter over a high heat to get it nice and golden. Then turn the heat down to low and let the onion just sweat very gently for about 20 minutes and just mellow down and release all its lovely oniony juices. Then we're going to add three quarters of a pint of whole milk, one and a half pints of vegetable stock or any stock you like, you then bring it up to a gentle simmer and then you add the roasted pumpkin and what happens to the pumpkin is that it comes out of the oven, when it comes out of the oven it sort of looks rather like this, the little gondolas have got nice and charred around the edges and the skin comes off the pumpkin quite easily because the pumpkin's soft now when you're, when you're roasting it and you want to know if it's cooked or not just stick a skewer into it and if it feels nice and tender then the pumpkin is cooked then just chunk it up as I've done here and the pumpkin is now ready to join the rest of the soup over here which is just coming up to simmering point so in it goes stand well back because of splashes give it a good stir and I think we'll have just a little bit more seasoning of salt and pepper we can do a bit of tasting later and I think one very subtle addition that's very nice is this, which is whole nutmeg. Grate it yourself, just a few scrapings like that. That'll now come back to simmering point and it'll take about 15 to 20 minutes to be ready to then be pureed. Right, here's the finished soup, which has been liquidised, but I've also quickly passed it through a sieve because pumpkin does have a few fibrous bits and now you can see how lovely and smooth and velvety it is. But what I haven't told you that this isn't just roasted pumpkin soup, it's roasted pumpkin soup with melting cheese and the melting cheese in this case is an Italian cheese called Fontina which has a very very quick melting quality. If you can't get Fontina cheese then you can use Gria cheese which also tastes good and actually has a good melting quality. Now, really, you should just leave that for one minute. Don't let it come back to simmering point, but just leave it for one minute and then take it hot to the table, ready to serve into your soup bowls. Then, as a finishing touch, add a swirl of creme fraiche, or it could be double cream, and a sprinkling of grated fontina or gruyere, 
that's it, roasted pumpkin soup with melting cheese. Well that was a mild and mellow soup. Now I want to show you by way of contrast something spicy and hot. This is Libyan soup with couscous. First brown six ounces of finely chopped raw lamb in a tablespoon of hot oil. Now in the same pan, brown a large chopped onion and two finely chopped cloves of garlic. Next, you dry roast and crush one heaped teaspoon of coriander seeds and one heaped teaspoon of cumin seeds. After that, two more spices, mild chilli powder and powdered allspice. The meat is now returned to the pan before you stir in five ounces of tomato puree, a fresh green chilli and two teaspoons of caster sugar. Add a pint of ready-made lamb stock and a pint and a half of water. Next, four ounces of chickpeas. These have been soaked overnight in cold water and then drained. Stir the soup now and let it simmer very gently with a lid on for about an hour. Then, just before serving, add two ounces of couscous, a tablespoon of chopped parsley, the same of chopped mint, and leave it to stand for three minutes. Serve with a lemon wedge for each person to squeeze into the soup and some warm pita bread to go with it. Well, now I want to show you a real star of a soup. This is black bean soup, and it's going to be served with a black bean salsa, which is nice to have this sort of combination of really hot, but something chilled to go with it. Well, we're going to start by making the soup. In my pot here, I've got two tablespoons of olive oil. They've just been brought up to heat. And now I'm going to add pancetta. And this is Italian cured bacon. Now, pancetta comes, as you can see there, in packets in flat slices. It has quite a lot of fat on it, but you don't have to worry about the fat because the fat renders down during the cooking. Now what you should be doing with that now is just giving it about five minutes to become golden and a little bit crispy. And then to the soup pot we're going to add lots of other ingredients. And the first of those ingredients is a large onion which has been chopped. So that goes in to join the pancetta. Second one is swede and that's been diced and then next to the swede there you can see carrot so a large onion two ounces of swede and two ounces of carrot and then we're coming to another ingredient that you might be familiar with if you watch the summer collection and that is coriander and what i'm using here are the stalks and this little little heap here is a is a clove of garlic which has been a nice fat clove of garlic which has been previously crushed. Now just turn those vegetables around in the juices, keep the heat low and then the principle of soup making is always to draw out all the flavours and all the juices. So what we're going to do is just put a lid on and leave that to just sweat and release all the juices for about 10 minutes. Now while that's happening, I just want to talk to you about black beans because they're the star of the soup, really. And the good thing about them is they don't have a great deal of flavour of their own, but what they are good at is absorbing other flavours. Now to deal with those, what you need to do is put a little note on the fridge and remind yourself to soak them overnight because that's the easiest thing to do, is just cover them with twice their volume of water, soak them overnight, and then the next day they look like this. They're sort of swollen up, and then they're ready to make the soup. Now, if you forget to do that, you can bring them up to the boil and boil them for 10 minutes and leave them for three hours. So if you do forget the note on the fridge, you know, all isn't lost. Now, after 10 minutes, you take the lid off the saucepan and you add the soaked and drained beans. So we'll do that now. In they go. It's very nice looking, this soup. I always enjoy making black bean soup because they're so pretty. Now we're going to add some other flavours. Here I've got a teaspoonful of cumin seeds and what's happened to these is they've been dry roasted in a frying pan and I'm going to show you how to do that a bit later on and then crushed with a pestle and mortar. And then the final ingredient is this to give it a little bit of a kick which is Tabasco sauce and you need a teaspoonful of Tabasco sauce which comes out of the bottle quite slowly and wisely because if you add too much 
it blows your socks off. So there we go. Teaspoonful of Tabasco sauce and stir all that in. And I have to remind you that when you're using dried pulses that have been soaked, don't put any salt in at this stage. You salt soup made with beans and lentils at the end because salt tends to um, draw out moisture and what we're trying to do is get moisture into them. Final ingredient is stock and I've got two pints here of chicken stock or it can be vegetable stock or any stock you like and nowadays if you don't have time to make stock it's quite easy now to buy even fresh stock in little tubs in the supermarket. Give that a stir, bring it up to a gentle simmer, leave the heat as low as possible, put a lid on and leave it to cook for one and a half hours. To make the salsa, first place three tablespoons of the cooked beans into a serving bowl. Add a skinned and de-seeded finely chopped tomato, a fat green chilli, de-seeded and chopped, and a finely chopped red onion. Now some fresh coriander leaves, one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, and the juice of half a lime. Taste it now, add some seasoning, then mix it well and leave it aside for an hour for the flavours to develop. Then what happens to this soup is it gets whizzed to a puree and what you end up with is this lovely, soft, smooth, creamy textured soup. And as a contrast with the hot soup, we're just going to put a swirl of creme fraiche in and then top that with the black bean salsa. Well, all I can say is I just can't wait for you to taste that. You're going to love it. And now I'd like to introduce you to the complete winter soup collection. Beetroot, well, you either love it or hate it, but I bet anyone at all would adore this velvet textured Polish beetroot soup served with a garnish of soured cream and grated beetroot. This is chickpea and chilli soup and this one's served with a garnish of finely shredded red and green chilli and some coriander leaves. These are fried crisp shavings of parsnip and they're served as a garnish to this slightly sweet curried parsnip and apple soup. Now you're about to see black bean soup again, but here it is, this time served in the same bowl as another soup, white Tuscan bean soup with a garnish of frizzled shallots and pancetta. This one's a real winter warmer, French onion soup topped with croutons and melted cheese and underneath a wonderful mass of slowly cooked caramelised onions. And to finish, a soup with a Scottish influence. This is smoked haddock chowder and it's served with little poached quail's eggs. Autumn and winter do have a lot of pluses, you know. What you can do is lock yourself into the kitchen and get to work making a preserve, something that will take you all through the winter. So find yourself a little spare time and make a fresh and sun-dried tomato chutney. And we're going to start off here with sun-dried tomatoes. I just want to explain these to you because although they've taken the nation by storm a bit, get a bit boring sometimes on menus, these you're probably not used to seeing because these are not preserved in oil. They're just dried and left as they are. And what you do with these is you put them into some warm water and then just let them soak for about 20 minutes to be reconstituted. And then they're going to be combined with fresh tomatoes, four pounds of fresh tomatoes, and the combination of the dried and the fresh tomatoes together really gives the most wonderful concentrated flavour to the chutney. Now I'm going to take you through the method, but first of all we're going to deal with the spices. And the spices I'm using are whole coriander seeds and whole mustard seeds. But the first thing I want to do is dry roast them to just draw out the flavour. So my pan here has been sitting on, on the heat, getting really nice and hot. And I'm just going to add the spices to the pan, coriander first, and then mustard seeds. And then what happens here is you just let them sort of drift around in the heat, no oil, nothing, for about a minute or so. And I hope, it looks very pretty like that, doesn't it? I hope that what will happen soon is they'll begin to burst and come to life and start popping. That's it, right. Now, before they all escape, um, transfer them to uh, a pestle and mortar and then just give them a little crush. And they don't need to be very finely crushed, just coarsely crushed. And then what happens is the tomatoes are all finely chopped. But what we've done is we've used a food processor here 
and I've got them already in the preserving pan. And what I've done is chopped the sun-dried tomatoes first on their own. They're quite hard to chop, so you do them on their own. Put them into the preserving pan, followed by the fresh tomatoes. And the good news on the fresh tomatoes is they don't need skinning for chutneys. Now, the next ingredient I'm going to use is chilies and garlic. And I've got four chilies here and four cloves of garlic. And I'm leaving the seeds in the chilies because this chutney does have a little bit of kick to it, which I think is very nice. I've got two red peppers here. They're going in to the processor as well. And now we're just going to give those a little whiz and chop them roughly the same size as the tomatoes. So it doesn't matter if it's grey and dull outside because you can get all the dazzling colour you want inside if you make some chutney. Now in they go to join the tomatoes. I'm just going to give the tomatoes, the two kinds of tomatoes, a stir first. And then they'll go in. What a stunning colour they are. You'll have time to scrape that a bit more carefully than I have. Next ingredient is going to be some onions. And here I've got four large onions. And these have also been processed earlier in the processor, so they'll go in next. And some salt, a dessert spoon of salt. And we won't forget those wonderful spices. They're going to go in. So everything's going in together. And then the next ingredient is sugar. Very, very important ingredient in preserving. And in this case, I'm using eight ounces of soft, dark, soft brown sugar. So that goes in next. And then... If you're thinking, wow, eight ounces sounds, so that's going to be quite sweet, it isn't, because the other preserving ingredient, perhaps the main ingredient of all in a chutney, is vinegar. And in this case, I'm using a pint of cider vinegar, so that goes in. And then you just leave it to simmer very, very gently, just slightly bubbling, and you leave it for three hours, and then you give it a test to see how it's doing. Right, now the chutney's had almost all its cooking time, and you can see here the, where we started, there's a sort of a like, tide mark there, and it's gone down to nearly half its original volume. And the way you tell if it's cooked is you take a wooden spoon and you just draw it across the centre like this, making a trail through the chutney. Now, if that channel fills up with vinegar, as you can see that's doing now, then it does need about another 10 to 15 minutes. So you just leave it, give it another 10 to 15 minutes, and then give it another test. Well, now the chutney really is ready. If you stir it round now, and you just make a trail with your spoon, you see it doesn't fill up with vinegar. It's absolutely perfect. The chutney is potted into warm, sterilised jars and then kept for eight weeks before serving it, for instance, with a homemade hamburger. Or a good old British banger or a sandwich made with ciabatta bread and Italian cheese. What you're seeing before you now is a work of art, but it's also an edible work of art, because these are dried porcini mushrooms. And what I want to show you today is how to make a wild mushroom risotto, a classic Italian risotto. But besides porcini mushrooms, we also have rice. And this has to be proper risotto rice. Now, the one I've got here is called carnarole. You can use another one called arborio or another one called nano, but you must make sure it's called risotto rice because it's very important to this. And let me just show you the difference. If you look at long grain rice now, when you see the long grains, you can see how tiny they are and thin. And then you see these lovely sort of robust fat grains of rice. And that's what you need for risotto because they stay sort of al dente in the middle, which gives you texture. And then you get the lovely sort of creaminess around the edge. Now, you start your risotto in a medium-sized saucepan. And you need to have two and a half ounces of butter. And you melt the butter. And then as soon as it comes up to heat and just begins to sizzle like that, you add a medium onion. And the medium onion has been fairly finely chopped. Turn the heat down at that stage, then just give it a little stir and let the onion begin to cook gently while you 
deal with the mushrooms. Now, first of all, the porcini mushrooms, you actually only need half an ounce. And what you do is you put them in a jug, pour a pint of boiling water over them, and leave them to soak for about half an hour. And then take a sieve, line it with a double sheet of kitchen paper, and strain the mushroom soaking liquor through it, because you want to use this in the risotto. Now, the reason you do this is because they are wild mushrooms, and they sometimes have a little bit of grit and dust in them. So this is just to take the precaution to get that out. So just let that drip through. And we're also going to use in the risotto some fresh mushrooms, because the combination of the dried and the fresh gives the most wonderful mushroom flavor. And these mushrooms, this is eight ounces here, of nice, open, dark gilled mushrooms, because they have the best flavor. And what I'm going to do is cut them into roughly half-inch size pieces. This might look a bit big, but actually, as they, as they cook, the mushrooms, as you know, reduce down in size. And so you need them quite chunky to begin with. Now, originally, making a classic Italian risotto involved quite a bit of hard work, really. Well, not hard work, but what you had to do was you had to stand by the saucepan and stir, then add a little bit more liquid and stir, then add another little bit more liquid. And really, it meant that the person making the risotto couldn't sort of enjoy a pre-supper drink um, because you had to be standing over the stove, literally. So I've devised a method whereby we're going to make this risotto in the oven. It has all the same taste and flavor, but it's actually made in the oven. And the fresh mushrooms are going to go in to join the butter and onion. It happened one day while I was making a rice pudding, and I thought, wow, why should you stand for hours when you can just put a rice pudding in the oven? And so we tried it, and it worked, and here it is. Now, you just stir the mushrooms into the buttery juices, and then add the porcini. And what you do with the porcini is you just squeeze them really hard to get all the juice out, and then just chop them finely. Now, when you, when you go to buy porcini, you'll think they're very, very expensive. But in fact, as I've already said, you're only using a small amount. So if you actually work out the cost, it isn't expensive. And make up your mind whether it's expensive after you've tasted, because the flavor, for anyone who loves mushrooms, I promise you, the flavor is out of this world. I mean that literally. So there they go, in to join the fresh mushrooms. And now, keeping the heat low, you just need to let the mushrooms and onions just gently sweat and release their juices, and that'll take about 20 minutes. Then after about 20 minutes, you'll see everything sort of shrunk down to much smaller size now. The next thing you do is you add the rice, and the rice is actually six ounces, and you just add the rice. This is weighed on the scales, not as with the other rice. Just add the rice and stir it till all the grains are nicely coated in the buttery, mushroomy juices. And next, we're going to add the liquid. First, the straining liquor, which is here. That goes in next. And then, lastly, the Madeira. And I'm using, actually, a quarter of a pint of this lovely, nutty, dry Madeira. Now, we're going to let that come up to simmering point. I'll turn the heat up there up to a gentle simmer, add a good seasoning of salt and freshly milled pepper. And then what I'm going to do is transfer it to the oven. It's very important when you're making an oven baked risotto to have the dish hot. So what you do is when you're preheating the oven, you put the risotto dish in to preheat as well. And perhaps I better tell you a little bit about the size of this dish. This one is actually nine by nine by two inches deep. But you can, if you want to, use a round, a nine inch round diameter, shallow dish like this. And we're going to transfer the risotto mixture into the dish. And the reason you need that dish really hot is because if it wasn't hot, when you've poured everything into it and put it back in the oven, it's going to take a while to come back to simmering point. And it does actually need to come back to simmering point before you cook it. Now, just give it one stir with the wooden spoon and then transfer it back into the oven to cook. 
After 20 minutes in the oven, the risotto has another star ingredient added to it. And this is Parmesan cheese, but not any Parmesan cheese. Two tablespoons of grated Parmigiano Reggiano, which is the best Parmesan cheese in the world. We've got the best mushrooms and the best Parmesan cheese. Sprinkle that in, then just give it a little stir around like that. So it's going to taste even more wonderful. And then back in the oven, again, no lid, and give it a further 15 minutes cooking time. After 15 minutes, you take the risotto out of the oven and just cover it with a cloth while you get everybody seated. It has to be eaten fairly quickly because the rice goes on absorbing the liquid. Have some nice hot plates ready, get everybody seated. And before you serve it, I just want to show you what a risotto should actually be like. And here you can see we've got lovely sort of fat grains of rice with still some definition in them still some bite in them, but also there's quite a bit of creaminess, just a tiny little bit of liquid and a little bit of creaminess around it. And before you serve it, it's going to have one more ingredient, and that's a little bit more Parmesan cheese, and let everybody help themselves to a little bit more when they eat it. Well, I hope I've been able to prove to you just how simple it is to make a really superb Italian wild mushroom risotto with, as you can see, very, very little effort. And now we're going to move on to another Italian classic recipe. This is a great favourite of mine. If it's made properly, it's wonderful. And it's called spaghetti with carbonara sauce. Begin by cooking the pasta in a very large saucepan of boiling salted water for about 8 to 10 minutes. We've seen sliced pancetta. Here's the alternative. And for this recipe, 4 ounces has been cut into very small cubes and then tossed into a pan containing one and a half tablespoons of very hot olive oil. While that's happening, take two large eggs and two extra egg yolks, four tablespoons of creme fraiche, and four tablespoons of Pecorino Romano cheese, which is sharper in flavor than Parmesan. Then give everything a really good mix. Drain the pasta now and return it to the saucepan, then quickly stir in the carbonara sauce and the pancetta coating the pasta in the sauce, which is now cooking in the heat of the pasta. Well, that's a nice, easy way to cook and serve spaghetti, but is there an easy way to eat it? Well, I think there is, and I actually think trying to wind it round a spoon is quite difficult. So I want to show you my method of eating spaghetti, which is to push it all to the side of the plate and leave a little gap like that, which gives you room to play. Then I think the secret is not to take too much. I think most people start by taking too much spaghetti. Now what we want to do is find a long piece here. That's it. So th about that much altogether. Then take it to the space on the plate and then holding the fork down flat like that, just wind it around, pressing down so that you should end up with a nice sort of bite-sized piece of spaghetti to eat. Am I going to eat it? No, I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to say goodbye. That's all about soups and warm suppers. And I'll look forward to you joining me next time when we're going to be cooking game and poultry. Bye-bye.